Hello, Lisa here. Welcome back to my channel. I was really excited to have been working with the Alchemical Tarot Renewed 4th Edition for quite a bit of time, just steadily working with it. And I recently picked up the Tarot of the Alchemical Magnum Opus. Now these are both decks by Robert M. Place. And I know I just kind of jumped right into it without much of an intro. Hi, hope you guys are doing great. But what I really, really wanted to do now that I've worked with this deck for a while and now that I have this deck in my collection is do a side-by-side -side of the two decks so you can see really the intention behind, I think, especially the Tarot of the Alchemical Magnum Opus. Now, currently, I believe you can get either of these decks from Robert M. Place himself. His website is probably on one of these. Ah, yes, there we go. RobertMPlace.com. Hopefully you can see that there. These are both really very nice quality decks. I love Robert M. Place's art style, especially here in the Alchemical Tarot. And the Tarot of the Alchemical Magnum Opus is just something I'm really geeking out on right now. And I'm looking forward to really just working with now that I've worked with this deck for quite a while. So I'm going to dive in. I've already put my Alchemical Tarot 4th Edition, Renewed 4th Edition, back in its original order. But let's just do a brief talk about the cardstock. These, this is a standard size deck, and it's a really nice feeling cardstock. Um, it's got some flexibility, it's got some shine, but it's absolutely beautiful. This is a very classical feeling deck. I love the colors, I love the art style, and I love all the red alchemical symbols that show up throughout this deck. I haven't fully finished the book that goes with this deck, and I didn't bring it to show you guys, but it's quite hefty. It isn't sold with this deck, rather it is um, a separate thing you can purchase and it's quite it's quite big. Check out my um, last weekly deck review check-in about my time with this deck if you want to see more detail. Um, by the time this video goes up I may also have done a final wrap-up of my time working with this deck during the month of January. Uh, so you can check that as well for more information. If either of those videos are up when I publish this I will try to remember to put them up in the cards <clears throat> but if not you can always ask me or just search my channel. So this has been a really great deck to work with. Now the Tarot of the, Mal the Alchemical Magnum Opus, this is just, can we just talk about this box for a second? I like lost my mind a little bit from a geeky perspective when I got this because it's really nice. It's like a fabric covered cardboard box. It slides off like this. Like it feels like really, this is gonna last forever. Like especially compared to something like this, it's like a flip top like box. This literally feels like a labor of love from Robert M. Place. And I just think, you know, he really put put a lot into designing this. <clears throat> when you pull the cards out, you've got little thumb holes on each side. This deck is gilded and it's a really fun size. So we know that the, this is what the backings look like. We know that this deck is standard sized. So just to give you an idea of the sizing, we're looking at wider and shorter than a standard tarot deck. So hopefully you can see that. I'll put it this way as well so you can really see the shortness. But it's actually a really nice feeling size. Like it's easy to handle um, and it just feels really good to hold. This is a matte cardstock. If anything, there's a bit of a satin sort of sh satin finish maybe, um, but it feels pretty matte to me. And it's thin and flexible. I have not tried to shuffle it yet. Um, I will try to do that at the end. The cardstock thickness wise, let's just see. I think it feels about the same thickness, possibly even a little bit thicker. Um, so this is this one. And what we're going to do today is that this Tarot of the Alchemical Magnum Opus comes with a little white book. Now you can get a little white book for the Alchemical Tarot Renewed 4th Edition. It's a digital copy and you can get it on the website if you've purchased this and you don't want to go through the big hefty giant book. Um, but this little book is what we're going to use to sort of quick reference the meaning of the cards because there's just a really short little blurb for each card so it'll be a lot easier to go through. The guidebook itself just has a bit of an introduction which is similar to the in introduction to the alchemical tarot and goes into the major arcana <clears throat> and then each individual suit. So I have put both decks in the same order so that we can flip through them together. I'm going to zoom us in so that we can see the images and we're going to go we're going to go through them together and just see where we land. So I'm going to have this open just so I can quick reference it. So oh, it would help if I actually zoomed in like I said it was going to. So let's do that first. I might be too zoomed in. Let's come out just a little bit. Oh, that's probably perfect. Okay. Oh, here's where we can check the cardstock. Yeah, they're basically the exact same height. So they should be the exact same thickness. This one may be just a hair thicker as a deck. Oh my gosh, these are going to slide all over. We'll see how I do. 
Wish me luck, guys. All right. So first we have our Fool. This is the unnamed card in the Alchemical Magnum Opus. The image of a joker represents the alchemist at the beginning of the work. His ignorance is necessary for him to begin to learn. So here we have an image for the Philosopher's Stone. And the idea is that this first, um, the Fool is sort of the person undertaking the journey. The Magician in both decks represents the Materia Prima or the source material from which the Philosopher's Stone will eventually be crafted. Here you have the symbol here for Materia Prima. Prima. Um, and I might get some of my symbols wrong, so bear with me. You also have all of the suit symbols represented and the astrological symbols up here. But here it's distilled down to, we're still looking at um, a Hermes-inspired figure in both cards. Um, and we have this red and white caduceus in both cards. So you're seeing sort of the necessary symbols, Materia Prima, for the magician. Our Priestess of Water is our first stage of disillusion. She's the disillusion of water. So here we have the symbol for disillusion and the symbol for water. And it just says um, she begins the separation of the elements called disillusion. She is water, esoteric spirituality, intuition, a secret or something that cannot be spoken. And I love that he's really captured her essence in the um, alchemical magnum opus. The Empress in uh, Robert Place's alchemical tarot represents the white queen. And here we have the disillusion of earth. Our red king with the disillusion of air. And the Hierophant, which is our Dissolution of Fire. So again, we have Dissolution and Fire here. And we have this multi-crown. A lot of his illustrations are actually, or his, his art here is inspired by alchemical artwork that's like on record. So Priest of Fire versus the Hierophant. The Lovers is Conjunction. Now, Robert and Place's original deck featured this version of the Lovers. And in his more detailed guidebook, he talks about the... Conjunction is actually a little bit more alchemically correct in the Alternative Lovers card, which I'll show you next. Content warning, because it is somewhat graphic looking. Um, but here we see that his Alchemical Magnum Opus features this more gentle or foreplay, what he calls it in his guidebook, version of Conjunction. Um, this is sort of the precursor to the actual Conjunction of the Red and White, Red King and White Queen in Alchemy. And here, oh, I guess I should keep this here. Here's the alternative lover's card. This was actually the original lover's card that Robert Place had designed for this deck, but a previous publisher did say he couldn't put that in there, which is why he developed this lover's here. Now, when I'm working with the deck, I have been working with this version of the lover's card <clears throat> because I feel like it more accurately depicts the alchemical representation of the card. So here we have conjunction. I think this is really sweet. The chariot, which represents sublimation. And here we have mercury sulfur and salt represented with these alchemical symbols and this is the stage of sublimation which this symbol represents and this is really a cool card because robert place describes this in his book but he talks about the fact that he had an, a vision or a um yeah i guess a vision of the charioteer sort of welcoming him onto the back of the chariot and this is that view which i really love we have all the same symbols here though we still see that mercury is here in the chariot's position and we have Sulfur and salt represented with the white horse and the red horse. Justice is the stage of disposition. So we have this sort of symbol here, which actually mirrors the look of the scale, which is a really cool overlap, actually, of imagery. Exaltation, which is our hermit. And we still have this Ouroboros symbol surrounding the exaltation symbol here. Again, very distilled down and a limited color palette, but really beautiful. The Wheel of Fortune represents circulation, which makes sense, right? We're talking about cycle. We have all four elements represented here. Um, and we also have, so we have earth, fire, water, and air. This is also talking about mercury, salt, sulfur. I might have gotten those mixed up. Um, the little C here is the circulation symbol, um, alchemical circulation symbol. <coughs> In the strength card, we have fermentation. The fermentation symbol. There's two symbols here, and I can't quite recall which one is which. I, there is a glossary of symbols in Robert Place's bigger book. Let's see what the little guidebook says about the strength card, because I kind of abandoned that. So above the lion of strength, um, the sun and the moon pour their essence into the flaming heart, representing control through love, self-control, and discipline. So I'm, I'm not sure about these two. It's interesting, though. We still have this heart, sun, and moon in both cases. Oop, I bumped my camera. Sorry about that. 
For the hanged man, we have the crucified serpent. We see the snake wrapped around up here, and here it's wrapped around the pole here. And it says, represents the process of calcination. So this is the alchemical symbol of calcination, in which the serpent, who is mercury, becomes a willing sacrifice, suffering loss, discomfort, and illness. Putrefaction, putrefaction for the death card. So this is the, I thought it was putrefaction, but I guess it's putrefaction for death. This is the depth of Negrito, the first black stage of the magnum opus, symbolized by the raven, the end of anything, decay. So there's a lot of correlation here. This is the alchemical symbol for putrefaction. <clears throat> In temperance, we have distillation. This is a really cool image because this image here is from a piece of alchemical artwork. This is the alchemical symbol for distillation here. And here we literally see the distillation process. Um, with, I believe this is the Materia prime, Prima here in the center, which is the Sun, the Moon, Mercury. I'm pretty sure that's what that is. Oh, I guess I could read. Let's read what it says. Um, distillation. Um, used to nurture the perfection of the stone. Health, beauty, balance, art, timing. The Devil is coagulation, which we see up here in that alchemical symbol. And we've just distilled it down. We know we see the Devil here, right? It's very simple. The tower is the greater disillusion. So remember, the original disillusion was in the first four cards. We have the, or the second four after the magician, you could say. So we have the magician representing the materia prima. So just to remind you here. And then we have water, dissolution of water, dissolution of earth, dissolution of air, and dissolution of fire, right? But then when we get further on down the alchemical pathway, we get to the greater dissolution. So that's what's happening in the tower. And I just think this is really beautifully represented. We have sort of this... Um, dissolution here of back to the red and the white. Um, again, I believe that's sulfur salt, but I could be wrong at this stage of the alchemical process, but very, very cool. I think this is super simple. And you even see this little cauldron of fire down at the bottom of the card there. Um, here you still have the taps coming out, right? They're breaking it down into the, the two materials again. In the star, we have baptism. The siren of the philosopher is giving forth blood of suffering, which is on this side here, and milk, which is nurturing, with the ladder of the planets above. So here it's got that ladder of the planets up here. Um, represents purification and the peace beyond blood red fear and milk white hope. So calm, understanding, and ascent symbolized here. And here, oops, here we have the symbol of baptism up at the top right. <clears throat> the moon or lapis albus. The feminine moon represents the white stone that will become the philosopher's stone when it is reddened. Rest, retreat, anticipation, preparation, and dreams. The sun, which is the greater conjunction. So here we have that sort of, just like we had the greater dissolution, we now have the greater conjunction. Um, the joining of the yellow sun and the white moon brings us into the citrinitus, the third yellow stage of the opus, spiritual love, soulmates, marriage, and enlightenment. Resurrection is our judgment. You can see the correlations here. We have the skull with the wheat growing out. We have that here as well. And wheat growing from the skull symbolizes life from death, rejuvenation, healing, removing blocks, and recalling the past judgment. And the world card in both decks represents the philosopher's stone. Now we're into the minor arcana. And here we don't have to dive quite as deep into the alch alchemy of everything, but you'll always see the alchemical symbols um, of the element in the uh, alchemical tarot. And here we've got a Marseille-style ace of coins. We still have the little white hair here. In the two of coins, we have the lion, which represents the fixed, devouring the eagle, which represents the volatile. And we just have a more traditional two coins represented here, but here we have the sun and the moon. In our three of coins, we get this idea of sort of growth, study, work, or apprenticeship happening. Our four of coins, we have our dude here who's burying the four coins. So there's that conservation element. In our five, we have this beggar element happening or loss. In the six, a rebalancing, a give um, after a period of coming back into your own, having something to give again. In the seven, and I'm going to read what the little thing has to say because I want to get this part wrong. <clears throat> the coins are labeled as the seven metals that transform from lead at the bottom through iron, tin, copper, mercury, and silver to gold at the top. Moving through stages or transformation is what this represents. So here, instead of seeing the different colored metals, you have all the different planets. So you have um, Saturn, Mars, Jupiter, 
Venus, Mercury, Moon, and then Sun. Same thing you see over here. In the Eight of Coins, we have this Mastery, Refinement, the Nine of Coins, and the Ten. These both have really powerful images, although we have a female image here and a male image there. Very cool. The Lady of Coins, we have her holding some flowers. She's enjoying what she has. Same thing here. There's an, there's an idea of sort of um, appreciation. The ladies um, in both decks are the companions. They're not lesser than. They're the companions of the knights. Our Knight of Coins, and we get this idea of industry and steadfastness in both cards. I'm just going to straighten them out a little bit. The Queen of Coins, she's really holding on to what she has. She's holding on to her wealth. Same here. And we get this wonderful lion imagery for the, for the king, somebody who's definitely the master of his domain. And we're into the cups. Always my favorite suit. So we have our Ace of Cups. Oops. Our Two of Cups. I love this image so, so much. I love the idea of these two figures coming together and then what they're sort of, what's blossoming from between them. I think you still get that here, but it's just so potent in this image. <clears throat> and our Three of Cups. And we have, I'm just going to pull up what it says here too, in case it references these three here. The cups supply the three elements not of this suit. Fire, earth, and air. So friends support a support group. So this is the water suit, but these are your helpers from other elements coming into play. This does the same thing because we see the diamond of earth, the flame of fire, and the clouds of air. So same exact idea, but this is not represented by people. This is. The four of cups, the elephant. Standing on four cups represents a conservative position, strong but stuck and not moving. So there's a precariousness to being that rooted or that stuck in your ways, right? The Five of Cups, I love that this, these both feature the bird because this is really showing on the alchemical tarot several stages of things sort of falling apart, right? You have spilled contents, you have a, um, one of these vases or vessels has shattered and from it these birds have broken loose. So there's this idea of freedom from this, whatever this difficulty is you're going through, there's an idea of there's also a gift of freedom from something, a situation, a relationship, also in this same process, which I think is really cool. And the Six of Cups, let's see what it says. Gardening. This cup represents six stages in the growth of a flower. Growth, nurturing. Oh, growth and nurturing, obviously. Okay, so here we have watering the flower, the seedling, the little flower, um, or the little plant, rather, or the bud, the, the beginnings of the flower when it's not quite open. I guess it's still called the bud, the next stage of the bud, and then fully growing. I really like this. You get a bit of that here, but this is even better. I love this idea of sort of nurturing something and really feeding it. This reminds me of the saying that the grass is greener where you water it. I don't know if that's intended or not, but that's what I get from it. In the Seven of Cups, it says, choice. Of the Seven Cups, the one with the symbol for the Anima Mundi is the best choice, which is really interesting. Um, and here, the one with the symbol for the Anima Mundi is the best choice. But none of these seem to have the... That's really interesting. This... Oh, I see. So here we've got the... Oh, this must be the Anima Mundi here, the eye and the diamond. I thought there was a different symbol for that. Um, interesting. Okay. The Eight of Cups. Embellishment. One cup has been embellished with a chasing tool, creative work or variation. So this particular work is sort of... step. It's breaking the mold, right? These all look identical, and this one's sort of been further enhanced. And here we have a similar thing. I'm not sure what this symbol is. I don't have that glossary of symbols handy and I don't remember, but interesting, interesting. It's an emotional refinement sort of in both of those last cards. In the Nine of Cups, this is really, really cute. We have the goat. A sure-footed goat leaps over the stack of cups, experience, confidence, and perspective, which is really cool because for me, the Nine of Cups is about emotional fulfillment, but that fulfillment comes from a place of perspective, growth, having been through it, right, and learned. And then finally, we have our Ten of Cups, which is the fountain, This, uh, the many become one, connectedness, a network, a family, the internet, which is really interesting. Our Lady of Cups, I love that her emotions are right on top. She's very balanced and poised. Her vessel is open. Um, a lot of times in Marseille decks, for example, that vessel would be capped. I really like that it's open here, intuition. The water glyph hovers above her cup, intuition trusting the unconscious. Oh, this is in the page, that's right. The page's cup is open, my bad. Normally we have a fish in a cup, right? So that's kind of interesting. 
I love this Knight of Cups. It has almost a feminine sort of grace to the body language here. I feel like we lose a little bit of that in the Knight of Cups in the Magnum Opus, but you get the idea with the with the fish on its shield. What does it say? Questing. His crest, the fish, is a messenger from the unconscious, seeking information, questing into the unconscious. Nice. Our Queen of Cups. Here we have our covered vessel. So I just got those two mixed up before. The King of Cups. Now I freaking love this image so, so much because we have this water spout that's coming out and this this King of Cups is literally filling his own cup. And this reminds me of that image, but it isn't quite fully there. It works because it'll always remind me of this idea of filling your own cup, but it works because I'm familiar with this deck, at least to me. But whales are wonderful representations of the King of Cups anyway. They're comfortable going below and above. They can work down deep into their emotions, but they can also surface, which is really good. <clears throat> Ace of Swords. So I keep clearing my throat, but I'm like losing my voice a little. So the Ace of Swords here, these are very similar. I feel like the important symbols are definitely there for this. These are also very similar. We have our Cross Swords. We have our Owl of sort of wisdom and deep knowing. In fact, let's see what it says. Um, The Duel. The Owl of Wisdom hovers between crossed swords, a debate actively questioning and seeking wisdom. It works. Three of Swords. These are both really, really, really beautiful. Uh, the pierced heart, pain, suffering, heartache, and growth through suffering. And I always see, because I see threes as a number of growth, it's more numerological association with the three. I always see this three pierced, um, three swords piercing the heart and the sort of grief of this card as sort of learning through difficult mental and emotional experiences, right? Having had those difficult experiences and learning from them, sort of learning from your mistakes. Our Four of Swords is peaceful. Third Eye is open on this card. It's it's suggested in this card. <clears throat> the Anvil of the Five. That's an interesting approach to the Five. So he says, fixing what is broken, righting wrong. So this is sort of the aftermath of what's happened in our, say, Rider Waite Smith Five of Swords. There's been a conflict. There's been upheaval. And this is now about sort of what you do to fix it after the fact. Our Six of Swords sailing the boat sails in the same direction as the swords not into the points going with the flow a higher power so that's that idea of sort of being shepherded away from the situation love that we have the fox in both seven of swords i love the fox as a symbol for the seven of swords he says here a trickster cleverness dishonesty amorality acting without judgment our eight of swords the beast, he is a beast because he is imprisoned in a cage of swords, trapped, blocked, or repressed. So this is very much about sort of the blocked shadow in this deck. It's really cool. Love this depiction of the Nine of Swords. It's actually something I really love. And one of the one of the reasons why I chose this deck over the Tarot of the Sevenfold Mystery, I really liked this approach the best. Because the idea is that he's trying to make his way through this room where all these swords are dangling. And any of them could fall, but he's kind of being overly worried and overly defensive and his panic is more likely to cause problems than help them and i like that in the magnum opus version of the deck that we still have these swords hanging over this person's head the ten of swords this is great without being bloody which i love <clears throat> the lady of swords i love that she's playing music i think that the page or the princess of swords is somebody that often is Somebody listening to them, listening to their, um, their I want to say their desires, but that's not quite it. Um, being able to listen to the muse a bit. Uh, here we have she playing her violin. So eloquence, music, poetry, and song. Our knight of swords, the hero, he fights the dragon of evil and has made it his crest. Being judgmental, a hero is judged by the size of his foe. Interesting. In our queen of swords... We have, she sees clearly what is positive, which is the upright sword, and what is negative, the downward sword, allowing her to make an informed decision or choice. Our king of swords as the eagle. Again, this is the element of the volatile, whereas the king of pentacles, who is the lion, is the king of the element, of the fixed element, right? So we have fixed and volatile showing up again in just the majors here. Or I mean, not the majors, in the kings. We have our ace of wands. We still have our salamander. We still have our wand. That's perfect are two of wands. And what it says about this card, because it doesn't matter, let's see. Um, Hermes and Aphrodite. A torch labeled Hermes joins with the one labeled Aphrodite. So we have Mercury here for Hermes and Venus here for Aphrodite. Uh, one lover lost in the other or united passion. So that's a really cool approach to that card. 
There's something else I was going to say that I forgot. Oh, that's right. Um, something to bring up too is that in this little booklet, he talks about how cups are intuition and um, emotion, but f uh, wands are fire and fire is feeling. So feeling isn't the same thing as emotion, right? It's like, it's like the feeling. I don't know how to describe it. He does a much better job in his book, but I thought it was a really cool distinction to make. So we are two of wands or two of batons here. In the three, we still have the ship. Now I talked about this in my check-in um, video when I was first working with this deck, but this shows sort of replenishment. The flame, the, this new torch is coming to sort of add support to these three, which is a really cool way of looking at the three of wands or batons. Now I'm stuck on the whole wands versus batons thing. <laughs> In the four, um, let's see what he says here in the little guidebook. In the four we have, oh, that's the swords. Let's get into wands. The joined hands. This is a Renaissance symbol for marriage, the embracing of opposites, marriage and commitment to passion. And this is really, really cool because there was another deck, uh, the Raven's Prophecy, that had five burning fingers in its um, imagery. And I was like, why though? And here's what Robert Place has to say for the Alchemical Magnum Opus. He says, creative energy, a flow of creativity or to work with the hand. So it's that like feeling of like energy flowing through you or work flowing through you, which is a much different interpretation than the Rider Waite Smith competition sort of vibe. I really like that interpretation of the five. It's much more numerologically appropriate, I feel like. Um, the six of wands, we have the laurel wreath. The woman is honored with laurel wreath. Again, we have a, a gender change here, which is really fun. So we have a female here. We have a more male figure here. The seven of batons, we still have this like snarling dog or wolf. What does it say here? The mad dog. So this is where the competition shows up. Competition, argument, aggression, and passion out of control. In the eight, we have the axe. Cutting back, simplifying, and focusing, preparing for the fire. In the nine, we have the phoenix. A symbol of, oh no, 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 no. Yeah, we do have the phoenix. Why is this one a dog? Oh, so in here we have a phoenix, a symbol of the rejuvenating power of the stone. Rebirth, strengthened by ordeals, renewed strength. So here we have a wolf, I think, or a fox. or Yeah, I think it's a wolf <clears throat> in the flame. So I feel like in this deck, it's like just before that phoenix moment. Aha, I'm right. Okay, so in this one, it's before. Oh, oh, I read the wrong thing. Let's try this again. The reason why is because in the book, it actually had nine on both. I had to correct it by scribbling out the extra one or I in the Roman numeral. So this is actually called um, drawn to the flame, a necessary sacrifice being overcome with passion. That makes way more sense with the um, overturned flames here. And this dog or wolf being in the middle of the fire there. Now we're in our Phoenix moment and these two echo each other beautifully. Our lady of batons, the dancer dancing in the hot dry desert dance, love of the new. Both of these um, ladies have really beautiful dancing postures going. Our knight is the explorer marching into the desert and uninhabited territory seeking a new location. Queen. Now here she's got one gold and one rough um, wand. What does it say about her? Liberty. She presents a choice between what is coming up and what is going down. So that's what it says here. We still have that sort of liberty crown happening, but you have this same idea. We have rough and we have gold. So there's like a decision to make there. Interesting. And then we have the king of batons, which is the dragon. Dragon is a master of fire and a master of feelings. He knows what he likes. So that, my friends, is a comparison of the alchemical tarot. Let's zoom us back out. Renewed fourth edition and the tarot of the alchemical magnum opus. These are both stunning, stunning decks. One definitely has a much more pippish kind of classic old world sort of feel. One has a more painted feel. I feel like if you're really a fan of, of Marseille style decks, you might really like this, or if you just enjoy more pippish decks. Although, even though they are pippish, the meanings are definitely there in the pips. It's it's definitely one of those decks that, that gives you hints of the meanings from the more illustrated or more um, graphically depicted deck. But if you really like decks like, say, Pagan Otherworld and that sort of thing, you might really like this one. I don't know. They're both beautiful, and I'm really pleased to have them both. I think these are very smart and well done. So thank you so much for hanging out with me for this full flip through a deep dive of the alchemical tarot and the alchemical magnum opus. I look forward to hearing your thoughts down below about both of these decks and I'll see you all again very, very soon. Bye.